Welcome to episode 42 of the Princeton Podcast, produced by the podcast production team at HG Media, providing audio and video production services here in Princeton since 1999. In this episode, our Princeton Podcast host, Mayor Mark Frieda, welcomed David Ketty, founder of Walkable Princeton. Founded in 2013 to raise awareness of issues relating to zoning and the built environment in Princeton, Walkable Princeton is an independent group that advocates a positive vision for Princeton's future, taking full advantage of smart growth principles adapted to our community with the goal of reducing automobile traffic, increasing pedestrian activity, enhancing the tax base, preserving open space, encouraging sustainable living, and enhancing a vibrant Princeton downtown. So without any further introduction, let's join our host, Mark Frieda, and his guest, David Ketty, for episode 42 of the Princeton Podcast. David, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's our pleasure. So let me start with this one. David, when did you decide to set up Walkable Princeton? Well, I guess, you know, since, since you reminded me, it was, it's all the way back in 2013. So I got, we're at our 10-year anniversary, which is hard to believe. Um, but yeah, it was tied in. It was, um, I mean, I'd cared about walkability issues and walkable urbanism going back to my college days in the 90s. Um, but uh, yeah, it was in the connection actually with the hospital redevelopment. That's actually what spurred it um, back in 2013. I wrote a letter to the town topics entitled um, Princeton needs more apartment buildings. Huh. Um, and I got a lot of response to that. And so out of that, we started walkable Princeton. I just sent another letter um, to the editor announcing, you know, hoping people would express interest and people did. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, so are the goals of the group today, the same as they were in 2013? They are. Um, they are. I mean, the landscape has changed a lot in terms of how people think about land use development. Um, when we started out, that idea of wanting to build um, mixed use in town, greater density, was very new, it seemed, to most people. Whereas now it's a more common kind of sentiment, so awareness around land use issues and what kind of, what we want the town to look like. Um, but it is, yeah, our, goal, our goals are the same, uh, you know, affordable housing, uh, sustainable land use, walkability, um, uh, the ability to use transport, you know, where land use is ad- aligned with walkability, bikeability, public transport. Those, those have been our, our goals all along. They remain our goals. Yeah. So looking at the website, you do reference smart growth principles. Do, yeah. And so... You know, I always like to say to people, okay, what do you, what do you really mean by, right? what does that mean? <laughs> what do we mean by that, smart growth? Because it is sort of a weighted term. It implies that we think we have a good idea um, in, in how to do growth. And by smart growth, we mean, um, you know, mixed land use. You know, I, I'll just give an example. Like, like yesterday, you know, my kids, they started swim lessons at Community Park Pool right here. They, they walked here, right? They walked back. Um, my wife went out, my wife went to work. She works just on our block on Nassau Street. She walked to work. You know, we went out on a date. We went to Blue Point Grill. So we had a nice short walk there. You know, on our way back, we ran into a friend who wanted to hire our kids to pick up her mail. They could walk to her house on Maple Street. Then we went to Via Palmer Square to Halo Pub for some ice cream for, you know, like that's a certain vision, a certain lifestyle that we're, that Princeton, Princeton's history and Princeton's land use enables us to live, my wife and I, and our kids. Um, and, uh, and so by smart growth, we mean something that enables that. What, it mean, what, it, what it's positioned over and against is sort of the context in which like I was mostly raised and my wife was mostly raised, namely like late 20th century suburbia, which was great in many ways, but which was every time you went out your door, you had to get in a car. Yep. Anytime you wanted to do anything, you had to get in a car. In our case, as kids, our parents had to get in a car and, and drive us. Um, and so, it, so it's a vision. What are smart growth principles? Yeah, mixed use. What, what do we mean by that? Like housing alongside retail, alongside commercial, alongside office. Um, uh, built not with like huge setbacks and giant parking lots and massive retention basins, but built like Nassau Street is uh, close together. It's a different set of trade-offs from the suburbia 
of our youth um because of course yeah my neighbors you know are one foot from me on one side and four feet on the other <laughs> side so of our house on moore street so obviously they're different there are different trade-offs with that that smart growth but it's a way to to enable more people to live in princeton and the town to be more affordable um and more sustainable to not be so car dependent um uh uh, yeah, that, that's the purpose behind those smart growth principles, as opposed to needing to find, you know, another 10 square miles to put up suburban houses on or build more highways, which I don't think we're going to do in central New Jersey. Um, uh, you know, that era has passed. So smart growth principles, that's what we mean by that is really it's traditional urbanism um, and bringing that back and making it possible again. All right. OK, that's a great explanation. Thank you. Uh, Walkable Princeton is an independent group, right? I mean, you guys are... Yeah, I mean, we're not incorporated even or anything like that. I mean, there's no money involved. Um, it's it's a website. That's the most organized <laughs> it is. When we started, you know, because we were trying to push the um, the uh, Avalon Bay development um, and not and not allow that site to be downzoned, that's actually what prompted it. There was a push to downzone the old hospital site when it was being redeveloped. And... Um, and so that's actually was the very specific thing that prompted me to start walkable Princeton. Cause I was like, Oh, we need more units, not fewer. And, um, but people were sure we were being paid by developers. <laughs> they were sure. And they were sure I was going to, um, be living in a penthouse in Avalon Bay. So for the record, 10 years on, I do not live in a penthouse in Avalon Bay, but yeah, we're just a, we're just a group of people who live in town. And we have no, we have no, in that sense, we have no formal legal organization. Um, and we certainly, we don't take money um, from anyone uh, for what we do. We're just passionate about a certain vision of walkable urbanism. There you go. Yeah. No conspiracy there. No, no indeed. <laughs> Bummer. No. <laughs> I would welcome, if anyone wants to offer me a penthouse. But, you know, yeah. anyway, I, already, I already live where I want to live, you yeah. know, in the heart of town. So I don't even need it. It's a good thing. How did you guys decide on the logo? You, you, you yeah. I mean, my wife came out with that years ago. I assume you mean like I know. Can you recognize what it is, Mark? No, I, 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 no I'm pretty sure I know the two like, buildings. You want me? Yeah, I've been in, I've been in town a long time. So. That's right. That's right. That's right. Because what is you know what's the the geographic heart of Princeton? It's the corner of Nassau and Witherspoon Streets, and you see there. You know, if you stand at Fitzrandolph Gates, and you know look across at, at Witherspoon, what do you have? You have what was a bank building originally, you know, five, six story structure on the left. And then, um, which is it? it's upper pine. I think they had, there was used to be a lower pine, but I know the name of that building. I think it's upper pine and that beautiful building that has the Hamilton jewelers in it on the right. And cause that's part of our, like when we talk about smart growth or walkability or whatever, it's that it's that, yeah. you know, it's buildings built multiple story, you know, right to the street, certainly a commercial building, right to the street. You know, both those buildings originally had housing above. It's now offices. Well, no, actually, I think there's some apartments in Upper Pine above Hamilton Jewelers. But, you know, it's housing above retail. And right there in that compact kind of a way such that it's, it's actually possible to, 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 to walk. And, of course, they were built at a time when, like, you know, it was horses competing with trains for transportation. Um, in Princeton and you know but I, I do think we we look at that and we see not like a legacy we see a good legacy we see not a not a museum but a, a blueprint for what it could be uh, yeah. going forward and it's even better I mean that logo now you know with the redevelopment of the redoing of Witherspoon Street you know my wife we were just walking past it yesterday and I was commenting to her you know this has worked out really well you know how that's been redone so yeah, yeah, I agree with how it's been redone. I actually, for the bank building, I actually remember when it was the first National Bank of Princeton. Yeah. So that goes oh. back a ways. And there actually used to be a bus terminal where Hamilton Jewelers is. Right. So, yeah, right. Times, yeah. Uh, times have changed. Yeah. Uh, so switching gears here just a little bit, David. Uh, where did you grow up? I grew up, well, you know, I was born in Pittsburgh, but I grew up, my earliest memories are in Scotland. My dad is Scottish came to America from Scotland. So he, you know, my mother's an American. Anyway, we, so some of my, five of my earliest years, my earliest memories, we were living in, in Scotland, Edinburgh, which is where my family is from, um, and Glasgow. And, um, and that's actually kind of key, because walkable Princeton, you look at the people involved in walkable urbanism, and a very large percentage are from Europe, hmm. and have those memories where we walked every, we didn't own a car, and like going to grandma's house meant walking to the train station, taking the train station into Edinburgh, you know, walking to her, her apartment. Like that was, 
so we we have those formative experiences in Europe. But anyway, I grew up. We moved back to America when I was seven. I grew up in State College, Pennsylvania, where Penn State University is. So I mean, I grew up in a suburban cul-de-sac, but next to a college town, and so and that's probably also key. You know, I always lived in towns, even though I was growing up in America in the late twentieth century, where um, you could walk. Play there was that walkable vibrancy that came from being a university, and obviously Princeton. You know, when I came here, same deal. So I all my all my experiences have been in places that were were very walkable. Thank you. Um, I think I think you you might have said this. I'm sorry, but when did you move to Princeton? I moved. I came here as a student. Um, my wife and I met here as undergrads in the late '90s, and uh, I've been a townie since 2004. So I was here as a student um, before that. Um, but I, I moved uh, into uh, 44 Van Deventer um, back in 2004, and we've been residents ever since. I mean, we, you know, in our pursuit of affordable housing in our early years, you know, we were in Van Deventer a couple places. We lived in. Canal Point for a few years, so that's technically West Windsor, and we lived in Greg's Farm, which people thought was Montgomery, but I want to point out that Greg's Farm is, in fact, in the municipality of Princeton, yes, so we were is. on the northern edge, and now we yeah. live at 24 Moore Street, um, but so we've lived there many years, so right right in the heart of town, um, but we're long time Princeton, I mean, by Princeton standards, I mean, not compared to you, I think, <laughs> you'd have us beat. But, you know, we think of ourselves as deep townies. My son was born at the old hospital in town here yeah. on Witherspoon Street. My, my girls were born um, out in Plainsboro, the new hospital. So we, we think of ourselves as, like, real lifers um, at, at this stage. Yeah. I mean, I've been, you know, worried about land use issues in Princeton since at least 2013. So <laughs> it gives me deep roots in town, I think. There you go. Um, so how does one interested in walkable Princeton keep up with what the group is doing yeah i mean you know our group it's primarily the website um you know walkableprinceton.com and um you can always communicate to us that's how people reach out to us usually is is through the website i mean you can you can always knock on my door 24 more street um or you could email me dj keddie k-e-d-d-i-e at at uh, uh gmail.com i mean you're always you're always welcome to just look at look at that website if you just google walkable princeton um, and you can look at what we've put out there over the years and the things we care about in terms of in terms of the town. And uh, yeah, so you're very welcome. I mean, we're we're part of sort of a loosely connected network these days of um, people who are concerned. I, I would say the primary conversation around land use in Princeton right now takes place in Princeton Progressive Action Group. You know, so that's also a place that I would point people towards if they're if they're interested in these kinds of questions. So does the group have actual members or it's just... Well, not in any formal sense. I mean, really, it's primarily, you know, myself and um, Sam Bunting. Sam's a scientist professor. Um, he and his family live in town. And so he was the one who came out and he writes, reads, writes our blog and primarily. And um, so really, it's like us, me and Sam. Mm -hmm. If you ask what Walkable Princeton is, it's me and Sam. But there are actually a lot of other people who are in, in various kinds of, you know... Um, connected networks who care about um, the, the same, issue, same issues as us. And we're always looking for more. Yeah, if you, if you want to go to planning board meetings and, uh, or board of zoning adjustment, you know, if, like, if you've ever read a zoning code, um, you know, that we can put you to work um, if you'd like to be put to work. Well, those are great meetings to find out what's going on in town and to, yeah. and to see what's coming because yeah. you can look at those that's decisions right. that are made that's and right. what's the basis for those decisions. I mean, those are pretty right. important meetings. Yeah, that's right. I asked Marvin Reed once, the former mayor of the borough. I was on the like town transportation committee with him years ago. And, and I asked Marvin, how do you get something done in town? And he said to me, because I was complimenting him on... Uh, um, you know, Heinz Plaza, like that. I remember as a student when that was parking lots, right, where D'Angelo yeah, is. And, and I remember that fight. That was before, long before Walkable Princeton. But I remember the fights in town over um, that redevelopment. So I was just complimenting on I, him on it. I was thanking him. You know, Heinz Plaza is such a sense of place. It's such a contribution. The new library, uh, D'Angelo's for that matter. You know, these, are, these have been really contributed uh, to the town. So I said, how do you get anything done? He said, you need six angry people to show up to a town <laughs> meeting. So we're not that, you know, at Walkable Princeton, but, um, you know, that was uh, part of that vision was trying to gather like-minded people who'd be willing to go out and speak, you know, a perspective uh, in favor of a, a walkable urbanist vision. Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you, well, let, me, let me ask you three questions. I'm going to ask you one at a time, mm -hmm. not all three sure, at once, yeah. but to deal with, uh, you know, the goals of Walkable yeah. Princeton. 
So the first one would be the group's goal for affordable housing. Right. Can you just detail, I mean, what, right. what's behind that? Or what? Right. Because, I mean, it's, it's an interesting, like, you know, yeah, what do we really care about? I mean, I think the thing that pushes us the most, pushed me the most, was the question of, of affordability um, in the town. I mean, it's true. I had, like, a general interest, like, when, you know, when I moved into town off of campus, I wanted to live where I could walk places. I wanted to go out my door. And this was true of a lot of people in my generation. You know, I wanted to go out my door and be able to do something. And I, without, and I didn't even own a car. Um, but I remember I was living there in 40 over 4 Van Deventer, and it was this really expensive. I was paying all this in rent. I mean, compared to what I would have paid in State College to live in the heart of downtown next to Penn State University. I was paying all this in rent. And, you know, the apartment was in very bad shape. And it would have been cheaper for me. And we did this eventually when we moved to Canal Point. You know, it would have been cheaper. It was cheaper for us to move out to Canal Point and live in a much nicer place and buy a car or buy a, you know, buy a second car than to stay in town. And so I remember, I remember that experience. And I was like, why is that? You know, me as a young college graduate back in 2004, oh, why is that? And, uh, and if it's too expensive, if it's expensive for me, um, you know, how are all the people who work in town or live in town, how are they affording Princeton? So definitely affordability. I do my work as, as a chaplain uh, with a, a group, the Princeton Christian Fellowship. It's not part of the university, but it's affiliated. That's how the, the religious ministries are often at the university, right? We're not funded by the university, um, but we have some recognition from them. And in my work with, it's particularly with grad students, the undergrads are all taken care of, but you know, the grad students, they want to live in town. They don't want to live on the, down by the lake. Yeah. You know, the university is putting new grad housing up in the West Windsor fields. Yeah. You know, it's like uh, we have we have one friend, you know, she's from Scotland, actually, um, like myself, more so than myself. But, you know, she's from Scotland. And, you know, she came here. I picked her up from JFK Airport, brought her into town. But um, but, you know, she asked like she would always ask, can I get that place on? Can I walk there? It's like, no. <laughs> can I take a bus there? You know, Quaker Bridge Mall. I'm like, no. <laughs> you know, you're a few years odd. You know, we, tie, we had to teach her to drive. You know, she bought a car. She just bought a car. And, um, you know, she got through in, in Scotland without owning a car or knowing how to drive one. In Cambridge, in Oxford, where she did her undergrad, and the University of Cambridge, where she did her master's. Um, and so that affordability question, that, that pushed me. Um, and that's why I take the time. I mean, it's not for my own sake, like we live right in the heart of town, um, but it is that affordability question. And affordability requires more housing to go up. You know, that was the key when, when Avalon Bay, you know, the really provocative letter that I wrote, Princeton needs apartment buildings. Um, and uh, where there was the desire to, to reduce the number of allowable units, you know, and that would cut in half the number of, I mean, just in absolute terms, right? That cuts the number of units. And so we were just that that question. It requires us to to build housing. And so every time I look, we were sitting in Blue Point Grill, my wife and I, yesterday enjoying a wonderful dinner. And I was I was facing the window, and I'm looking out at um, the Seven Eleven that's there. You know, and the post the post office is now in the back of that building. And you know, for me, this is just so you know how my mind works. I look at that, and I'm like, why does that one story building exist in that location, right? Like, that should be a, an apartment building right there. And, you know, it, without parking, for that matter. Like, the number of postdocs, the number of young professionals, frankly, who work in New York City or work remotely now, who would love to live in that location and walk and be car-free, like, that's high. You know, I don't know if a developer, if there was no, if there was no zone, no, no uh, parking mandated, and if you could build a big, you know, a, a five-story apartment building there. Um, I don't, you know, it, they would have to decide to do that. But that's how my mind works. I look at that and I see housing. You know, we were walking past Halo Pub and there's that open parking lot. There was a restaurant long ago in front of Mistral, you know, and I look at that and I see housing. That could be housing, you know. Um, and uh, so anyway, that's how my mind works. It's like, how can Princeton have more housing? Even my mother, you know, she's looking to move out here now to be closer to us and to, to her grandkids. and. And, uh, you know, where can I find a one-bedroom apartment, a two-bedroom apartment for her? You know, those are the, the, um, the, the questions that go through my mind. And so, so that's, that's probably the thing that most motivates Sam and I to show up to planning board meeting. I mean, Sam just loves the wonkish details, you know, like yes, he's he a scientist. Yeah. Um, but that's what, that's what gets us, um, you know, um, into, into this municipal building and, or down to the courthouse in Trenton when, when things go, you know, go, go to the judge. Um, to speak speak on behalf of of uh, more units, we think of like the downtown as the best place to put that. You know, like how can we put units yeah. in a way that's not 
purely suburban oriented. There's a lot involved in that. There's a lot that could be said, but but that is that is um, the the fire that that pushes us forward. Yeah. So what, what what's the feeling or what's the thought process? I mean, I get the whole thing adding more units. Yeah. But at what point does adding more units actually equal affordable units? Now, so affordable, right. and I, and I don't mean right. necessarily set aside the mo- yeah I don't mean yeah. like the court decision affordable housing but I mean yeah. people that what we would consider have nice jobs but right. still can't afford to live in this town I mean it seems right. we have housing market that's like you're paying a hell of a lot of money that's right or you're finding something from our affordable housing program and that's all correct. the stuff in the middle is being squeezed out of the town more and more every year that's right yeah what what would it take um to make Princeton affordable um, I don't know, I, you know, how, how, how like, if, if I'm honest, I, I think the baseline is more housing is better. And uh, uh, the vision is uh, a housing market that's responsive. Like, if I look at my hometown, you know, um, State College, Pennsylvania, um, housing just went up, right? What's the cost of housing? The cost of housing is a little bit more than what it costs to build a unit. Um, we had my, my, the development, the cul-de-sac I grew up in, you know, uh, like they put in a trailer park right behind it. I mean, people complained about it because they feared trailer parks, yeah. right? Um, and, but it went up, right? In that, in that context, in that political context in central Pennsylvania, nothing stood in the way of housing going up. And that's true even my, where my mother currently lives, Greenwood, Indiana. It's a suburb the, um, on the south side of Indianapolis. And housing just goes up fast, yeah, if I'm honest. And they have a lot of, I mean, one interesting dynamic is they have a huge wave of refugees from Myanmar, you know, who've moved there, thousands and thousands, because housing is, housing is cheap. But it is true, like, housing goes up. I looked at, you know, I do these comparisons when I really got into the details in Princeton, like, because, like, her suburb of Indiana, I mean, it's not very dense, but it's twice the density of Princeton. Not the density of the old borough, but it's twice the density of the, the municipality. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, if I'm honest, what would it take? It would take a lot of a lot of housing in Central New Jersey, just because. And I know that 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 worries people, hmm. you know, who are longtime home, homeowners. It's hard for them to see a a, um, a positive take on that. I did a calculation, you know, when Avalon Bay was built. You know, that's five acres, that complex um, just down the street here, and that's 280 units. And you know, so if you think in those terms. You know, like 10,000 units would take a couple hundred acres. No, I didn't do the math just now. Um, you can do it. Someone can do it for me. This is Princeton. Someone listening to this podcast. <laughs> but if you think about it, like if, 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 if a unit of housing takes an acre and a half minimum lot in the township, then you're going to need square miles. Yeah. Square miles to increase housing. Many square miles. And all those folks will be car dependent for everything. Um, Whereas I think you can, you can do a lot if we imagine. That's part of the conversation we want to have with Walkable Princeton. If you can imagine it, I think you can do a lot with a pretty modest amount of land. I mean, in principle, I'm committed to loosening zoning restrictions. So yeah. in principle, like I'll be honest, right? I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not interested in a few housing units here and a few there. Um, I'm interested in housing being something that people can provide that, that that can be built i mean for princeton i mean in truth like they're different like it involves it involves west windsor too you know they're finally putting up some housing around the the train station you know yeah. princeton junction train station like my wife and i there was a long time where there was a period where she worked in philly or then when she she went to law school in new york you know so she was commuting by train in different directions and i worked in town you know on campus but you know there, was there any housing by the train stations you know either the the dinky or the junction yep. no right yep. so i would drive her to the junction yep. you know and uh, from our, our these are things where you're like i don't think that's smart you know even what the university is doing i love the university i'm an alum but like they put up you know they're building on the west windsor fields and here they have a train line that runs there are they building along the train line? No. Yeah, I know they're on the other side. They're on the street. other side. Yeah, and what, and what, they, what, what was the first thing they built? They built a giant parking garage yeah. right there along Washington Road. I look at that and I say, if it, all due respect to the university, that's dumb. That's dumb. That's dumb for Princeton. That's dumb for people who just want a quiet suburban life yeah. where they can drive places, right? Because it's putting people, grad students, scientists, a lot of whom don't have cars who come from overseas. Yeah. 
is putting them in a suburban framework. Kind of forcing them to find Yeah, automated. exactly. So, so me, yeah, we need housing. Yeah. Mark, let, 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 me, let me hit one or two of your other goals. But sure, I will yeah. tell you this. The 280 units on five acres, we could get 11,200 units on 200 acres. There we go. There we so go. I knew somebody in Princeton could do that. So I yeah. won't mention who called in and did that. Beautiful. There you go. So let me just, because I, I want to hit your, your other two main goals Please. before we run out of time. So the next one is sustainable land use. So yeah. let's just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, it's that question too. Like, um, like you look at my carbon footprint living at 24 more, it's, very, it's much smaller than it was when I lived at Greg's farm. And that's because I walk, Yeah, you know, and no, I don't walk out of, cause I'm like a, a zealot, you know, who loves to walk. I walk because it would be dumb to drive. Like for me, the, 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 the quarter mile for me to walk to work, I would be worse off driving. I would walk farther from the parking spot the university <laughs> would give me. Right. And my wife too, you know, she works on our block, you know, for our kids too, like so many things, it's just more convenient. You know, my, my life, the number of restaurants and amenities, libraries, everything else within a quarter mile, never even a, never mind a half mile. And so that from an environmental perspective, that's just good. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just preferable. I, I think, you know, we have a lot of focus on electric cars and that's, that's useful, but you know, electric car still has a, a much higher carbon footprint than you walking on foot. Yeah. And so just, I think, I- extending that, you look, at, you look at Avalon Bay, you know, just to pick on that again, like that's the statistics would show us, the census statistics on, you know, those who walk to work who live in that location. It would tell you that's 140 people who otherwise, out of those 280 units, who otherwise would be driving to work in town who are instead walking to work in town. And uh, so those kinds of, those sustainable land use questions, I think, trying to get our heads around like, what does it look like to we have a, a a great resource here in princeton and that it's a place people actually want to walk like mm-hmm. it's a beautiful town it's a great town and it has a lot of people who work in it people don't realize how many jobs there are in the former borough it's actually it's a commuting destination both for work and for enjoyment yeah. right uh, in a big way and um and so there's an imbalance there's a shortage of housing in the heart of town relative to the number of jobs and either that, even, either that much more so in the age of, you know, of uh, remote work. Um, people want to live in a place where they can enjoy their life. And, uh, and that is available here. And so from a sustainability perspective, I think there's a lot to be said in terms of housing at a high, you know, density is a dirty word. Uh, traditionally, uh, um, I discovered that starting land use. But density is good from an environmental standpoint. New York City people have a much lower carbon footprint. Not that, we're, not that Princeton would ever be, I shouldn't mention the city, people always fear Manhattanization. <laughs> you know, we'd have to add more than a million people to, for Princeton to be Manhattan. But um, it, would, uh, it's, uh, it, it, it requires a different way of thinking. Not that I'm against cars as such myself, yeah. um, or suburban life, you know, I have fond memories of my suburban cul-de-sac. But I think as a town, we don't wanna be requiring that of our residents or of the people who work here. Yeah. Um, I, I think part of what happens in town is when people talk about density, um, some people just say, oh yeah, density is the answer, but it's like, well, okay, density is not just the, is not an answer if you just say, I want density. It's like, mm-hmm. well, how much density or where is the density or how, mm-hmm. are, you, how, are, you, how, are, how are you positioning so the density is achieves yeah. the goals you want? Yeah. So when someone just says, yeah, density is good, well, like, well, okay, there's a lot more to it than just that, so. Yeah, that's right. There's a profound difference between like putting up a, <clears throat> you know, a, a large apartment complex out in Montgomery or up on Bond Drive. You know, Princeton Community Village is an interesting example. You know, you put a large complex up there and people are car dependent, yeah. right? Whereas if you put up uh, apartments in town, people are going to, the evidence shows they're going to choose to walk because it's more convenient for them and so yeah it makes a big difference where you put it in my hometown state college pennsylvania they they put up like a four you know what a senior housing look like there they put up a 10-story apartment building right in the downtown because if you're a senior and you you know maybe you're past the point where you want to drive or you can drive like that was just a convenient place and so for their for them there in state college it was just a normal thing like a i mean 10 stories that'll that'll scare people but you know that in state college pennsylvania that was a normal thing that was a whereas here in princeton you know our senior housing is like fringe Mm -hmm. parts of town and we got our range buses and you know there's all this that we have to do because we're so committed to that automotive framework yeah 
All right, let me hit. Let me hit your one more. Thank you. Yeah, it's like three main, three major goals. Yeah. So the other one, uh, well, a little bit, but walkability, bikeability, public transportation. So let's just hit on on that for a little bit. Yeah, yeah, because it's it's all interconnected. It's like there was a there was a transit blogger, you know, some years back. He used the word "be on the way." You know, people will only not use cars if it's convenient not to use cars. And the, the funny thing about Princeton is, you know, obviously we have the walkability. If you be put up in a in a you know within a half mile walk of town in the former borough if you put up housing it's convenient to walk for a lot of things yes. for, for a lot of things um but it does it is it, it does extend beyond that you know a bike ability is is that extra range that's something that's been proved harder in princeton you know sam um bunting he's very eager on the because he's a biker he's more in the biking range of downtown whereas i'm the walking range of downtown um but it you know it, it that 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 is a key component in extending that range i think for a lot of people um having those bike lanes i think public transit the most overlooked for us in princeton resource that we have is that train line you know i mean I, i'm helped where i am i can walk to the end of my block and take a bus into new york um so you can do that but like we have that train line we have a lot of people now who they work in New York now two, three days a week. Yeah. And, um, and so they still need to commute some. And they would just love to, li- like that train line between the junction and Princeton, you could turn it into, you know, I mean, the, the, the Department of Transportation had different ideas for it, you know, to turn it into a streetcar line where it would come up here, you know, to Nassau Street, as, as existed, you know, once 100 years ago. Yeah. Right? There were streetcar <laughs> lines that ran right here. Um, and, uh, but that, where you, you built along the way, you know, you add stops, um, you redevelop instead of developing in a way that's dependent on cars or on, you know, shuttle buses. You build a linear town from the dinky, extending the dinky. I mean, I do think you want to extend it either as a bus or as a, as a streetcar up to Nassau Street. And you do that to a town. I mean, you think how many buildings we have in this region that are just spread out. If you just align them, align new development and new growth along the dinky line. I think you could do a lot um, to enable people to have that freedom to live in a way that wasn't entirely car dependent. Yeah. Um, and so that in terms of the long-term planning for Princeton, for the region, I think thinking about the public transportation component and not, you know, a bu- I mean, a bus that runs every hour and a half or, or, or whatnot, yeah. you know, no one's going to take that unless they're forced to, yeah. you know, they're going to just, doesn't they're going to buy a car yeah. if they, if they at all can and so I think, I think, I think have, having that vision, it's not like ornamental pathways that no one's going to use. You know, we had that at Canal Point. There were these sidewalks that oh, went yeah. over in yeah. this ornamental way. And people wouldn't use them. They'd walk on the road. Yeah. Because why would you use this yeah. weird, yeah, it's quicker, it's weird meandering <laughs> sidewalk? So it's not that. It is, it is what we already have uh, here in the town. But thinking, thinking about how we can leverage the assets that we have to accommodate future growth. Yeah. I mean, it's really... a you need to look at all this from a big picture point of view. So it's not just what am I building? It's where am I building it? Is there a transportation plan? Yeah. How, do, how do you get people around? How do you allow for people, like the, whether it's, they're walking, they're taking a bicycle, yeah. whatever it might be, but you have to allow for all this to happen. That's right. So, and you need to think about all of it when you're thinking about any of these things. You yeah. can't just say, let me focus on one thing because mm-hmm. that might get in the way of then the, the greater or better goal at some point in the future when you get around to it, and you're like, oh, I did this two years ago, and now it's in the way of what I want to do. Right. Anyway. Right. David, I want to say thank you. Thank this you. has been great, and I think a lot of people are going to enjoy listening to this podcast well, and listening so. to you. So thank you very much for being here. I appreciate you having me. Thank you for joining us for the 42nd episode of the Princeton Podcast. Produced by the podcast production team at HG Media, providing audio and video production services here in Princeton since 1999. If you enjoyed this episode of the Princeton Podcast, please share it with your friends. Visit our website at princetonpodcast.com and be sure to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon, or wherever you listen to podcasts.